Our first speaker today is someone that you've heard from in the past, a well-respected speaker at our first Friday events. Dr. Betsy Lamb is a Senior Extension Associate and the Ornamentals IPM Coordinator for the New York State IPM Program at Cornell. Uh, she works with a variety of stakeholders, including greenhouse and nursery producers, um, as well as uh, Christmas tree growers. But today we've asked Betsy to talk about IPM for indoor house plants. So Betsy, you can take it away. Thanks, Matt. And happy houseplant season, everyone. So I'm going to talk about houseplant IPM, or because it's near getting on for Christmas, I thought I would call it, keep your paws off my poinsettia. So I'm going to start with talking about water. And people are going to say, but water's not a pest. No, but it is the most likely thing that's wrong with your plant, is overwatering usually, rarely underwatering. And so um, how much water you put on, I had this conversation just the other day, how much water you should put on, and it's not a set amount. It depends on what the temperature is, it depends on the humidity of the room, how big the plant is, how big the pot is. So the best thing to do is to feel the soil and not just the top surface, because you actually want the top surface dry or just moist. Actually stick your finger down in the plant, get dirty fingers. Um, and that's a better way to tell if the plant is is has enough water in the soil. If there's algae growing on the soil surface, that's way too much water, <laughs> it's way too wet. And we'll give you some other pests as well as just too much water, which is why I bring this up now. Um, and so just to know that you can have wilting that's caused by too much water as well as too little water. So if you, I think you can see my cursor, if you can see here, this is a picture of a root hair out in the soil solution. So those soil particles, there's water, but there's also air because those cells have to respire. They have to breathe and if there's no air, um they will uh they'll just die it'll kill the soils and if it if it kills the root cells they can't take up water and nutrients and the plant is not happy it will wind wilt uh and let's see i see some questions but i think i'm going to hold on till the end for some of them see if there's something that makes more sense to do at a certain time so one of the things that i also that also ties in with water and is probably the most commonly told or asked me, that's not even a sentence, it's most common pest people talk about um, on their houseplants is fungus gnats. And fungus gnats are sort of mosquito looking, they're small, um, you'll see them fly out of the foliage if you disturb the foliage. You might see the larvae in the soil if you disrupt the soil. So here's a picture of a larva, it's got a black head capsule, but you can tell they're pretty small. This is a particle of perlite. And so they're not very big and they're pretty clear, so they don't show up very well. The adults you're more likely to see, and if you have sticky cards out to monitor what you're actually what you actually have going on, and I know sometimes putting a yellow sticky card out in your house plants is terrible because things get stuck to it, like usually my hair or something, my fingers certainly. But if you do catch some and you want to make sure it's a it's a fungus gnat, if you look and see here, there's this vein that looks like a Y, and that's how you know it's a fungus gnat. And they feed on, the, the larvae feed on fungus in the soil. And so what you have is water, you, you tend to have more of that. So <clears throat> you wanna keep the soil surface dry. And one way you might do that is put a layer of sa sand or perlite on the top of the pot to help keep that surface dry so that the, the adults won't lay their eggs there um, and then you won't have fungus net issues. So root rots are another thing that come along with too much water. Not all that commonly, but it is possible. And so you actually wanna look at the roots and what you want are nice white roots. This is a healthy poinsettia cutting, and this is a not so healthy poinsettia cutting that has roots that are brown. So you have to knock it out of the pot. Now, not all pots will work for that, I realize, but if you can check the roots, check the roots. So also we're often looking for damage kind of at the bottom of the plant here. You can see it's discolored and this poinsettia is, has wilted. Um, and you can also cut into a part that's wilted and look at the vascular tissue or sometimes just under the bark. Here you can see the vascular tissue is brown. So there's, a, there's an organism that's living in there and it's clogging it up. And that's why the plant can't get any water into that part of the plant. But more often than not, if you see wilting, it is... Um, it is actually overwatering. In general, we always want to talk about the having the right plant in the right place and light and humidity and temperature. And this relates a little bit to the question that's out there about bringing in still blooming lobelias. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, and the question, I guess, is, is are, are there a danger of ticks coming in with them? And I would say, no, that's not probably where your ticks are hanging out in your yard. Um, and so, 
uh, but bringing things in from outside, we have this transition from either warm inside to cool outside or cool outside to warm inside. And often the plants react by dropping leaves. But, but just in general, a plant that's normally an outside plant growing inside is often stressed because it may be too dry, it may be too low light. And so plants react to stress by dropping leaves, but also plants that are stressed are more likely to have other pest issues. So learn as much as you can about the plant's needs and try and match those conditions as well as possible. Someone said, well, I could put my poinsettia in the bathroom. And I said, yes, that's probably a good place for the humidity, but not so good for having people see it. You have to keep inviting people into your bathroom. But I have a hot Thanksgiving cactus in my bed bathroom, so I suppose I have the same issue. Fertility is another factor that can affect plant health and plant stress. And we usually think about something that's too low fertility as being a problem, but too high fertility can also, I mean, you're putting too much fertilizer on it, can also be a problem, especially for sucking insects, because the plant's just luscious and soft and full of wonderful things for them to eat. And they're sucking the sap right out of the vascular tissue. And so you might find aphids. They're not that common inside unless you bring them in from outside, which is another point about bringing plants in from outside is check them out before you bring them in. Or even if you just bought them, check them out pretty carefully before you bring them in and mix them with the rest of your plants. This is just a picture to show. This is from my yard. It was a really good aphid year this year. And if you had outside plants, you might well have had aphids, but you can see how fast the numbers grow. This is a typical aphid. One of the ways, you know, it's an aphid that has these little tailpipes out the back end. Um, but these spots that you can see here, this is a green peach aphid, and they're not all the same color. Uh, those are actually the eye spots of the next generation. So we often, often laugh, laughingly, but not so laughingly, say that aphids are born pregnant, and they're ready to produce another set of aphids if, they, if the temperature is right for them. Uh, so keep an eye out. That's another basic principle of all this, is you need to look at your plants frequently and see if there's anything there, um, and then deal with it as soon as you can. So managing aphids, you can take the plant outside and watch the biocontrol happen. This is if not in the winter, but this is uh, that same plant. And you can see parasitized aphids here and a hoverfly larva that is eating all the aphids right around it. So you can do that with plants in the spring and summer. If they've got issues, take them outside. And a lot of the, the pests that you have on your plants will get cleared up by the native biocontrols that are out there. But you can also spray it with water and knock the aphids off. Some, some aphids have um, alarm pheromones and they scare each other so that they will fall off and they're not very good at climbing back on. But a way to really do it is to just spray them with water either inside or outside uh, and knock those aphids off. And then that, that will help reduce the, the, the population. Most of these things are not just do it once, you have to do it several times. Mealybug is a big problem in house plants because we tend to see it on long-term plants, people plants that people keep for a long time. And they are very good at hiding themselves. They like to get in between leaves and in tight spots, but you can also see that they will happily be on the outside of the pot or actually between the pot and the soil. And so the management of these is definitely not just do it once. You'll have to keep after it. And they're mealybugs because they're kind of They've got fluffy white wax on them. Um, these are what the little teeny ones look like. They're called crawlers. And this is an example of, okay, if you were trying to control the mealybug on this plant, you might see this big one and do something about it and these, but you might not notice these little teeny crawlers that are moving around the plant and will become big and white and waxy like the other ones. So again, you have to keep after, keep after uh, management on it. And I'm putting scale in along with mealybugs because they have some of the same issues, also a sucking insect. Um, we don't see scale as often in houseplants, but sometimes um, they're protected by these covers. And so treating them is a little bit hard. You have to get under this cover. And what's going on under that cover is there's a female who's happily laying eggs and those eggs will, will hatch into little crawlers just like the others and start coming out and moving around the plant. The other thing is with these covers, it's hard to tell if they're dead or alive. So you do need to flip them over sometimes to see if you've done something to control them, if they're actually still alive. But <clears throat> how do you manage them if you do find them? I call this the big squish and scrape because 
Um, you're going to have to go in and put a, a wet Q-tip will help you. I love the fact that this person has green thumbnails so that it goes with the plant um, to actually squish them. You're going to try and get them and squeeze them, squish them and kill them that way. Again, with the scale, it's actually more likely that you would have to scrape them off carefully so you're not damaging the skin of the plant. And sometimes it's just better to get rid of the plant if it's really infested with either mealybug or scale because they are a bit difficult to control. And also, this is not house plants, but it is stock plants for a greenhouse. And if you've got all these plants that are so overgrown that you can't actually check them very well, it's much easier to have insect problems in there and sometimes disease problems also and not be able to do anything about it or control it very well. So another thing you can do if you're not actually going to replace, replace the plant entirely is cut it back so that it's smaller so that you can deal with the pests that are on it. Make sure you toss any of the parts that you cut off um, and in case they've got insects on them or other issues on them. Uh, and, then, and then sort of start over and grow it up from that point. So I, you haven't heard me recommend any pesticides. And the main reason I don't recommend many pesticides is the plant is in your house and in your airspace. So it's there are pesticides that you can buy that you should that are some that are labeled and some that are not. <laughs> but think very carefully before you start using pesticides um, on the plants. Partly because your cat, I have cats that like to eat some of the plants. Um, they, they're likely to eat it or you touch it or whatever reason that you're coming in contact with that. And we prefer that you don't come in contact with the pesticide residues if you don't have to. There are, however, situations where they're useful. And the big thing is only use things that are labeled for pests and plants and locations. There are lots of home, home remedies out there that are um, advertised. I don't know why it's always Dawn dish soap, but it's always Dawn dish soap. And I think it's because it has a duck on the label. Um, you can burn plants really, really well with, with uh, detergents. They're not meant to be applied to plants. There are insecticidal soaps that are actually meant to be applied to plants. But even then, so this is just to show you something about a label. This is a label for an insecticidal soap. It tells you where you can use it. It tells you what's in it. It tells you what personal protective equipment you should be wearing when you apply it. And we often don't think about that in terms of houseplants. And then it tells you what you could use it on and what should be controlled. And if you're applying something that doesn't control the thing that you're after, there's really no point in doing that at all um, because it's just a waste of money. But so that's my romp, very quick romp through um, houseplant IPM. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Betsy. I'm looking at the chat here and I think you addressed the first question um, <laughs> about ticks. So if anybody else has other questions for Betsy, please feel free to type them in the chat. There are soil pests to use to use. Yeah, and that's actually, that's a good point that, again, it needs to be labeled. But if you're buying, buying something that you can apply to the soil, then it's not going to be an aerosol and it's not going to be in the air. But remember that if it's applied to the soil, it's being taken up by the plant and it will be in the plant parts. So, so those are called, um, <laughs> the word just flew out of my mind. Not contact, but, oh, well. Systemic? Okay. Systemic, thank you. Uh, so systemic ones will, will thank you, Harry. <laughs> systemic ones are taken up by the plant and spread throughout the plant so they keep the pests from eating them. Um, white flies is another one. Um, and see, I knew if I didn't put something in, someone would have a question. So uh, white flies, <clears throat> again, you can find the larvae on the, the, the young ones on the plant and you can um, sometimes get them washed off with a jet of water or sometimes wipe them off with a Q-tip. Um, again, white flies will, the numbers can increase pretty quickly. And, and, and one of the big ways we bring white flies in is actually on the plant material that gets purchased. Um, and then, so some of both springtails and, and uh, plant, plant pill bugs are just feeding on dead material. So one thing you might do if you've got plant bugs, plant pill bugs or, um, um, whoops, What's the other one? I just said it. Uh, springtails is actually replant the pot, put it in new soil. So there's not as much organic material there that they're feeding on. They're not damaging the plant, but they are noticeable. 
Uh, spider mites, we have such lovely biocontrols for them in either outside and also in greenhouses, but it's very difficult to use biocontrol in your own house. Uh, and so spider mites is another one where you can wash them off and another one where, you know, keep an eye on the plant to see if you see them and deal with them quickly. Let's see. What do you think of diatomaceous earth, not the pool and to use on the top of the soil? There are lots of people, I've seen lots of recommendations for diatomaceous earth as a pest management. Be careful because it has a, it's a, got a dust. It, it has, it, it can be dusty and that's a, an inhalant, a problem for inhaling it. Um, so if I was putting it on the top of the soil to, to keep like fungus gnats or something for there to keep the soil top dry, I would use sand or perlite. Um, and so, the, but in terms of using it as a pest pest control, there's a couple issues with it. It's not perfect. Submerging plants in water for a while kill or drown mealybugs or scales or aphids. More likely to get the aphids to come off the plant, um, but those, those mealybugs are covered with wax and the scales have the covers and they actually could probably last longer than is good for the plant. So it's not... Um, it's not a perfect answer there either. Again, you, it'll help to wash off some of the honeydew from things that are that are sucking insects that are producing producing that sticky shiny stuff. But you can also do it by just washing the plant off and not necessarily submerging it. Um, thick layer on, so it only has to be a quarter of an inch or so thick for the layer of, of perlite or sand on top. You're just trying to keep that soil tops soil the top of the soil dry. What about watering the plants from below by adding water to the dish? There, in some things, um, yes, in terms of some things actually like to be watered from below better or it keeps water off the leaves so you don't get leaf spotting. Uh, some things like African violets don't like water on their leaves very much. So the plant will take up as much as it needs, but as much of the pot is as in standing water now has too much water in that pot, that part of the pot. So if it's a small pot and it sits, in a saucer of water for a long time, there's no air in that part of the plant. So it's a great way to water plants, but don't just put the water there and let it sit there for days. Um, you wanna put it there, let it soak up and then empty out the extra. So a, a few tips in alcohol is considered a home remedy, um, but you will find it listed many, many places. And so, <clears throat> Um, we can't recommend it because it's not considered an official pest pesticide use uh, in terms of how to control mealybugs or um, scale to some extent. Other ways, ways of dealing with fungus gnats, really truly the best one. I mean, there you can apply you can apply uh, pesticides to the soil, insecticides to the soil as long as they're aimed at fungus gnats. But really truly the best way is to keep your plants from being overwatered, and the plants kind of like that too. Uh, for spider mites, I didn't have really great controls. There are some pesticides that you can use. The other thing, though, is to is to rinse off or spray off the plants, um, is, and and wipe off any any spider mites that you see. But things, many things, don't like the wa the leaves so wet, too wet. So by spraying the plants, you can kind of they'll it will deter them, knock some of them off, and deter the others. Oh, help! We have constant fruit flies in our indoor compost. We cleaned it with boiling water and set up traps, but they are winning. Are they, and they are really fruit flies is one thing to make sure that they're fruit flies. Um, and I mean, I get them in the summer and I, I do things to trap them, but it may be how long you're leaving, um, yes, how long you're leaving your compost inside. Um, I'm not sure I have a fabulous answer for that. You have to change it daily and you still have them. Where are they hanging out? That's the other question. And are they hanging out somewhere else? Oh, in clouds. Yeah. Um, have What are you trapping them with? I'll wait for that and I'll ask. Oh, um, vinegar and honey. <laughs> Actually, uh, vinegar and a little a little dish soap is probably also a, a home remedy, but you're not applying it to the plant. Um, it works well for a trap because the soap keeps them in there. Um, dish of just soap and vinegar and water and often gnats, fruit flies and other insects are attracted and it is a trap that eliminates the problem. 
Um, I've I've used that, but um, mosquito dunk in the watering can, I don't think it's going to do that very well for you in terms of for the fungus gnats. And I have never tried to shave cedar on the top of the soil, and I'd want to know what's in it and what's going to leach out into the pot. And Matt, you can tell me when I need to stop answering questions. Um, best way to water and care for orchids. <laughs> that I think that has a lot to do with where they are in the room. And I missed mine. Um, and every once in a while, they'll rebloom. Um, I've gotten spruce spider mites on my Christmas trees for the past two years. It's a plant that's been brought inside. Any preventative remedy for this ahead of decorating the tree? And they are actually spruce spider mites because you wouldn't normally see those this time of year. They've usually gone dormant. What you might see are Sonara aphids, but they're much larger than spruce spider mites. Um, let's see. Oh, and Joanne was saying, I helped a homeowner with a situation like this. I think she means the fruit flies. I sent her searching and she eventually found a bag of, bag of rotting potatoes in the basement. Yeah, that's the other thing that I'm wondering if they're, if they're coming out of somewhere else. So see if you can track them to some other place besides trapping them. Um, um, so, and, and back to the preventative remedy for uh, ahead of decorating the tree, one thing is to just check the tree before you buy it to see if you're actually seeing spruce spider mites, but they are quite small. You'll see the stippling, um, sort of a, sometimes sort of a bronges or an orange kind of on the inside of the needles on the lower branches. Um, oh, Matt posted a, a link to um, a Minnesota uh, article on um, managing insects on indoor plants that I thought was pretty good. It has a lot of information in it. What are we doing? I think I, oops. Okay. Oh, and they start webbing. There's other things that do webbing too. I'll I'll look that up and I'll get an answer. I'll take an answer in there. <clears throat> so it's all yours, Matt. Sorry, I seem to have lost my controls. Are you seeing my I am slides or no? You are. I am. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, Betsy. Um, as you can tell, very popular topic, lots of great questions from the audience. Um, and we will, again, provide um, some answers to those questions in the description and maybe some additional links because there were a lot of questions about home remedies and, and some specific questions about pests. So we can try and track down some of that information as well. Um, so for the IPM Minute today, uh, it's going to be a real quick uh, discussion on a timely topic. And for this time of year, we chose firewood pests. Um, having come from the pest management industry, this was always an interesting time of year because you'd get callers saying that they had these really weird critters inside their homes. And oftentimes, uh, when there's just something really weird showing up in large numbers or all at once, it has to do with something being brought in, whether it's houseplants or in this case, firewood pests. So this is the typical situation, you know, people like the ambiance of having their fire and then also having firewood next to that. Uh, but sometimes that firewood doesn't get burned, it gets left there and that can contribute to pest problems. So really when we see these pest problems, they, they break down into two categories. Um, the first is a group of uh, arthropods called occasional invaders. And these are critters that are living in the environment that is attractive um, for them. So it's dark, it's moist and cool. Uh, they're living underneath that wood when it's being stored outside or at the bottom of a wood pile. Um, but when that wood is brought indoors, the conditions change. So it goes from being damp, moist and cool to being warm and dry. Um, and so this causes those occasional invaders to disperse from that firewood. So some of the things that we see um, occurring in large numbers all of a sudden when firewood has been brought indoors are pictured here. Uh, from centipedes uh, to this guy here in the center called a jumping bristletail, isopods, including sow bugs and pill bugs, their predators, which would be spiders, um, earwigs, 
Sometimes it's hard to tell in this picture in the center bottom, but those are carpenter ants that are overwintering in a crack of the wood. Um, carpenter ants can be brought in and dispersed in large numbers. Sometimes we will have uh, pupil cases of insects on firewood and those will uh, emerge and you might see a moth in the middle of uh, in the middle of the winter as well. Um, Joellen notes here that the pictures are not to scale. That's true. Um, so so <laughs> the jumping bristle tail is kind of a smaller insect and some of these beetles and spiders are much larger. Um, so those are the occasional invaders. The one that is even harder for homeowners to diagnose and recognize are the wood destroying insects. So these are critters that are actually um, developing in the wood and normally they would spend their entire life cycle over the winter in the wood and then emerge in the springtime to reproduce. But when we bring the wood indoors, the temperatures are warmer and that increases the rate of development for these insects. And so they will emerge during the winter time if that wood is left inside. And so again, um, not to scale, but you might see on the wood itself, uh, some frass or sawdust appearing beneath the wood itself. Um, and then you would see the emergence of these adult beetles in the house. They may be attracted to light. They may just be crawling around on surfaces near where that wood has been stored. Some of them are bright and showy, so they could be a little bit alarming and make you wonder where the heck did these things come from? Um, but all of them were developing in that wood and emerged indoors. The one risk to this is that um, if there are surfaces of wood inside the home that have not been treated, some of these organisms are capable of reinfesting wood. And so that is one reason to ensure that you're not bringing these pests in so that they do not infest wood indoors. So some, some basic practices, things that we don't wanna do, we don't wanna stack firewood on the bare ground. This is going to lead to moisture issues. Um, in addition to the pests that we saw, termites will also uh, invade wood that is in soil contact. And so that can increase um, risks of termite issues in the home. I've seen in my area, a lot of people stacking wood between two trees, and this can damage the bark of those trees and ultimately kill those trees. Um, so if we're trying to protect the health of our trees, it's best not to stack wood against trees and their bark. Um, do not stack wood directly against the house. This picture on the left shows a cache of, um, uh, let's see, those are cherry seeds and some mouse droppings. Mice will nest inside wood that's stored outdoors. And so if we put this right up against the house, we increase the chances that they might forage along that structure and try to get indoors. And then for all of these uh, critters that are associated with firewood, there's really no reason to treat them with insecticides to kill them. Um, we can just bring the wood back outside and avoid all of those issues. Things that we wanna do, uh, cover the wood during summer and fall to reduce the moisture of the pile. If you're bringing wood in from outdoors, shake or knock that wood to uh, dislodge any of the larger organisms and then use the older wood first. Um, that will ensure that you are, um, you know, hopefully having the insects emerge from that wood before you're bringing it indoors. Um, so I will stop sharing. I did want to mention um, that our 2024 schedule um, was just put up on the website and uh, we are now asking people to register for the 2024 What's Bugging You First Friday um, events. I'll put that link into the chat and then we will be distributing that to anyone that has registered for a previous First Friday event. So um, thank you everybody for joining us in December and for those that have joined for multiple months throughout the year, we thank you. Um, I appreciate Betsy's great talk today and for uh, fielding all the questions from the chat and we hope you have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful holiday season. Take care.